And uh, as I say, this is actually a project rather than a one-off lecture. So um, hence, as you can see on your slide, there is actually three of us involved in it, myself, Adam, and uh, a colleague from the Open University, Edmund King, who unfortunately cannot be with us because of the coronavirus uh, situation. Um, so the, the project has been going on for a, for a few years now. And um, so I'll, I'll say a few words introducing you to the project itself before I um, move on to my own part of the lecture. Um, so we got interested in this idea of offense a few years ago, pretty much because it was so much in the public eye and we were thinking, oh, offense is a big thing. People are talking about it. People are disputing what it is, what it does, how we should react to it. Um, so we started thinking about it and um, why Shakespeare? Well, first of all, because uh, we research Shakespeare, we teach Shakespeare, so we are Shakespearean scholars. But also, um, we thought Shakespeare was an interesting and uh, appropriate case study to be um, talking about the issues of offence. Uh, not because Shakespeare is the greatest, or you know, Shakespeare has the answers to all your questions. You know, uh, don't ask yourselves, you know, what would Shakespeare do if you know if you are in a tricky situation but rather because of Shakespeare's uh, very special, very privileged uh, position as an author in our culture. Shakespeare is, as you know, um, staged and taught very often obligatorily uh, in educational systems across the world. Uh, he's um, not only performed live, but um, screened and made films of. So he's kind of, um, he's ubiquitous like offense is. And also, um, in a sense, he carries a little bit more, um, not so much value, but a little bit more uh, power. It, it matters more to some people if you say something wrong about Shakespeare than if you said something wrong about, um, I don't know, uh, Erwin Welsh. So, um, so hence, hence Shakespeare for, for those two uh, reasons. Uh, and what we've been doing is um, we've kind of split up the project and uh, I'm looking at um, Shakespeare and offense in performance, Adam at uh, Shakespeare and offense in teaching situations, and Edmund has been looking at um, Shakespeare and offense in editorial practice. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk, uh, talk today about those two first uh, issues, but... Um, Let's hope at some point we can come back to the uh, editing as well. So with, without any further ado, a bit of warning. This lecture contains material that some viewers and listeners may find offensive. As does everything else, really. Um, but uh, a little bit more seriously. Uh, what... Uh, we would like to put our cards on the table and say what we are not going to do in those two lectures and what we are going to do in those two lectures. So we are certainly not going to resolve the question, which, as you will see, is very hotly debated, uh, whether offence is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, we are certainly not going to tell people what is and what is not offensive. You shouldn't take offence at A, but you should take offence at B. And we are not going to prescribe what to do about offense. What we are going to do instead is uh, reflect on different meanings, different definitions of offense. We are going to offer and discuss some examples of uh, when people took offense or gave offense. And we are, to some extent, going to outline the state of debate on offense, although it's, it's a huge debate, so we're only going to scratch the surface, probably. Uh, but particularly in the context of performance and education. So basically what we are not going to do is um, prescribe, what we are going to do is describe. So apparently we live in the age of offense and you'll, you'll find that, um, that phrase in a lot of titles, a lot of talks, a lot of publications about offense. Um, this is the age of offence. As you can see, uh, Joyce Fegan's uh, article in the uh, Irish Examiner is actually entitled Trying Not to Stay Silent in the Age of Offence. And um, some of the arguments about it go as, as she says. You can say nothing anymore. Some think it's political correctness gone mad. 
that people are too easily offended. And the uh, phrase I particularly like, it's like we are all talking on eggshells in case we cause someone offence. And some of the manifestations of this um, supposed culture of offence are the um, prevalence of trigger warnings in, let's say, lecture halls. Um, in many uh, educational situations now, lecturers warn students in advance what might be offensive or uh, upsetting. Um, the, the talk about safe spaces, again, mostly in educational situations. No platforming, trying to stop people with, uh, who offend you from speaking at your events. Uh, political correctness, that's a very old issue, so I'm not, not even going to start talking about it. And the woke culture, the sensitivity to uh, injustice, to political um, issues, which for some people has gone too far. So what I'm going to do now is uh, outline a few um, arguments for and a few against the culture of offence. And this is not exhaustive. Um, quite, quite a lot of other stuff is being said about it. So I'm choosing uh, those issues which are most relevant to my talk. Um, so an ar a key argument for uh, that the, offen the culture of offence is a good thing is that uh, it has allowed us to work out this increasingly fine-grained vocabulary for registering and opposing forms of sexism, racism, ableism, re religious intolerance. So basically, it stems and addresses the need to recognize and name sources of injustice. So um, basic impulse towards equity and social justice is served by uh, taking offense and arguing that offense should not be given. However, many more uh, voices, or at least probably louder voices, are um, protesting that the age or culture of offence is a bad thing. So they are talking against it. Uh, the first one is uh, it gives rise to the so-called generation snowflake. So young people, in particular young people, but I suppose it's spreading everywhere, who lack resilience, cannot face being challenged, and combine apparent hypersensitivity with an almost belligerent sense of entitlement that their feelings should take precedence. So kind of um, the way it's described, the way Claire Fox describes it, is kind of, um, you know, like these are the abominable snowflakes. They, they pretend to be so sensitive, but actually they are very, very aggressive and use this kind of um, offense to, to attack other people. Uh, what follows from that, uh, the um, opponents of the culture of offence say, is um, that this confusion of um, ideas with emotions. So feelings and emotions cease to be a personal matter. Emotions are mobilised to make a statement of outrage. Criticism and hard-hitting arguments are countered with a statement, I am offended, rather than uh, saying, I don't agree. And Frank Furedi argues that unlike saying, I disagree, uh, there is no comeback to saying, I am offended. So disagreement is within the realm of ideas, within the realm of reason, and you can argue. Whereas I am of offended is within the realm of pure emotions, and it closes down conversation and debate. So um, this um, fostering of, of snowflake culture leads to, um, to the shift from, some people even kind of um, talk about the um, end of enlightenment values, um, the uh, age of reason, and movement to the age of purely personal, emotional response instead. What follows from that, um, as Richard King argues, is actually quite, um, quite dramatic. Um, outrage does your arguing for you, and uh, you know, there, there is no, no more any debate. Free speech uh, suffers, but consequently what suffers is democracy. So democracy that suffers when sensitivity gains the upper hand. Important questions are put to one side in the interest of respect and appropriateness. Sometimes whole issues are declared off limits. And uh, as the argument goes, um, Democracy depends on free exchange of ideas and arguments. 
if we um, close that down, we live in the age of censoriousness and the debate uh, is uh, shut down and freedom and democracy itself suffers. Um, as I've said, there, is, uh, there are many more uh, arguments, um, particularly against the, the culture of offence. Uh, for example, that being offended breeds more offence because people respond in kind. But um, for, for my purposes, these, um, what, um, what is important are those uh, three key issues for, uh, for each um, position. So for um, those who argue that offence is a, the age of offence is actually a good thing. Um, they argue that because they say it redresses power balance. So if somebody has been in power um, for forever, like let's say uh, white men, uh, now it gives an opportunity to minorities and previously silenced and marginalised people to actually be heard as well. So the argument here is that it's not silencing; it's actually empowering people who would have been silenced otherwise, and that it helps combat injustice and inequality. Um, the, the arguments against the, key, the three key ones is that it privileges feeling over reason, the personal over the objective, and that privileging in itself leads to the stifling of rational debate and of free speech, and that in itself endangers democracy. So as you see, there are very, very serious uh, arguments both for and against. And as I said at the beginning, I'm not going to be um, taking sides in, in this debate, just outlining it. And then uh, what I want to do instead of um, trying to declare who is right, which I'm incapable of, um, I'm going to apply those issues and those debates uh, to some situations of performance. So the, uh, the next section of, uh, of my talk is going to be about offence and performance. Uh, why performance? Um, well, performance is an embodied medium. It's something in which, um, especially theatrical performance, you could say it stages a debate, but it also stages a debate in a way that um, both expresses feelings and emotions, and also um, engenders feelings and emotions in the audiences. So, um, in a sense, performance seems to me to be an ideal forum to be talking about um, have we lost sight of reason? Are we just talking about emotions? And um, those, um, those issues. Um, so, um, the next stage of, of, of my talk is going to be slightly more practical. So, what I'll do next is first have a look at um, some problems which are inherent in the very definition of offence and offensive, just, just the words themselves. And then I'm going to uh, see how those problems pan out in um, a few performative uh, situations. One of them will be an extended discussion of um, of the problem of offence in one of Shakespeare's plays, um, specifically Hamlet, and then a couple of uh, cases of offence when performing Shakespeare, staging Shakespeare in a specific way, has uh, offended somebody very recently. So these are cases from 2016, 2017. So first, to the boring bit. Oxford English Dictionary uh, definitions of offence. Um, I'm not going to read through them um, because it's, um, it's not that exciting, but what I would like to, to uh, draw your attention to is that um, they seem to be objective, bog standard definitions, but when you start looking at them, there are some um, problems there if we go by those definitions. So some ambiguities. So for example, the first definition says that uh, offence can be a breach of law, rules, duty, propriety, or etiquette. Well, depending on uh, who you are offending, uh, the consequences of those breaches can be very different. So for example, if you breach etiquette, well, you've, I don't know, you don't put on a freshly ironed shirt uh, in a formal situation, somebody might frown and that's pretty much it. But if you break law, 
in some situations, you will be uh, prosecuted, imprisoned in some area, in some places, even, um, even executed. So uh, the, the second, the law definition, um, illegal act or omission, a punishable crime. So offense could be punished by something which to us might seem very mild or by something that carries the full weight of, uh, of law and, um, and its consequences. Um, and then the um, definition three and four puts in doubt not just the magnitude of uh, offense and its, um, and its consequences, but also um, who decides what is offensive. Um, the action or act of offending seems to um, suggest that um, it lies with the offender, somebody who does the action. But then you look at the number four, um, and uh, you can see that um, it is a feeling, displeasure, annoyance, resentment, caused to, to a person. So it's, the offense seems to be on the offended rather than the offender. And uh, as the lovely brackets tell you, voluntarily or involuntarily. So it's, it's very difficult sometimes to put a finger on. You might say, I didn't mean to offend you. Well, but you have offended me. Offense has taken place. So th this was just to, to signal those, um, those different um, meanings of, of offense, even in a dry dictionary definition. Uh, what I'm going to do now is move on to, uh, to Shakespeare. And um, I was planning to cover a few more case, cases because Shakespeare actually um, is quite interested in the issue of offense. Um, the, the word offense, offend, offensive, and its derivatives um, crop up 303 times in Shakespeare's plays. Um, so there are loads of interesting examples, but uh, because of the constraints of time, I'll just look at one. But if you'd like to have a, uh, a look at a couple more in the longer version of this talk, which is going to be published by Gresham College online, you can read a couple more uh, analyses uh, of um, an instance in uh, Antony and Cleopatra and an instance in the um, second part of Henry IV. But Hamlet um, seems to be a, an obvious choice because it is a play which is obsessed with those problems breaches of law, rules, propriety, etiquette, um, but also breaches of law. What if somebody breaches the law, but somebody is the law? If it's the king, he establishes the law. Can he breach it? Can he not breach it? It's all very, very tricky. Uh, but it's, it's also a play in which uh, those meanings slide into each other. Something might be at some point only a breach of etiquette but then to somebody else, it becomes a sin or a breach of, uh, of law or a crime. And um, it's quite clear that, uh, that offense is central to this play, even in the very first scene when um, Horatio and Marcellus are on the battlements of Elsinore, uh, waiting for the, um, for the ghost to appear. Uh, that, that word offense uh, crops up uh, when when the ghost does appear, Horatio tries to address it, speak to it, and it won't talk back. It just turns and starts walking away. And uh, Marcelo says, it is offended. So um, at that stage, you might think, okay, yeah, if, you know, how dare you address a ghost? You are just a mere mortal. He's, the ghost is just offended because you've crossed some kind of propriety. But then very soon we learned that the whole play is going to be about finding out a crime. There was an offense committed against that ghost, not against the ghost, but against what it was before it became a ghost, if you know what I mean. Um, so, um, so basically from that first encounter, we move on into more and more in-depth and exciting um, exploration of what offense is and how those different meanings slip, slip and slide into each other and in the process problematize the whole issue of offense. So the next moment in the play, uh, you'll be glad to hear I'm not going to cover them all, but the next moment when the word crops up is when Horatio um, talks to Hamlet after Hamlet had talked to the ghost. So Hamlet is all shaken up because he's learned of the, uh, of the crime. And he starts talking quite wildly, quite strangely. 
And what Horatio says, um, these are but wild and whirling words, my lord. And Hamlet says, oh, I'm, I'm sorry they offend you heartily. Yes, faith, heartily. There is no offense, my lord. Yes, but Saint, by St. Patrick, but there is Horatio and much offense too. What is quite clear to the audience, if not to Horatio, is that the two uh, friends are talking about two different things. Horatio is just talking about um, offense as a kind of crossing of the rules of polite conversation, some kind of offense against social decorum, whereas Hamlet is already hinting at those much darker, deeper meanings of offense as crime, murder, sin, festering wounds in, in the state of Denmark itself. Um, next case, when the word uh, crops up they want to have a look at, is uh, Hamlet talking to his mother. And this is after Hamlet has um, staged or um, arranged uh, to stage the mousetrap performance, which um, was intended to catch out the king and uh, show his guilt. So um, Claudius runs out of the, of the room and then Gertrude comes to talk to Hamlet and says to him, Hamlet, thou hast thy father much offended. And Hamlet, with characteristic double uh, speak, says, mother, you have my father much offended. So not only here are we within the same uh, problematics as we had with Horatio earlier on, um, Gertrude is talking about offense as in you upset uh, your stepfather. It was, it was rude what you've done. Uh, Hamlet here is saying, is hinting at you've done something much worse, you've sinned. You've uh, crossed um, the law and uh, gods and human laws as well. But also, they are actually not even talking about the same people, with the offender and offended. So uh, Gertrude says, Hamlet is the offender, and the father whom he has offended, she means stepfather, Claudius. Whereas Hamlet twists it and says, she is the offender, but the offended father is no longer Claudius. It's obviously old Hamlet, so his natural father, not his stepfather. And as you can see, this weird sliding of um, and problematizing of offense leads actually to even problematizing of family relationships and um, identities. Gertrude goes, have you forgot me? Uh, you are the queen, your husband's brother's wife, but would you were not so, you are my mother. When you no longer quite know who your father is, and uh, you would rather that your mother weren't your mother, your identity and your um, psychological well-being is quite clearly becoming very disturbed. The third case of, um, of offense in Hamlet, which uh, I want to cover, is um, probably closest to the heart of, the, of my talk. It's the one um, uh, I e uh, to do with, with offense and performance. Uh, Hamlet obviously has a very good reasons to be offended. You know, his father had been murdered, his mother murdered, the, his mother married the murderer. So he's, he's got good reasons to be offended, but when he actually says something offends him, he doesn't, he's not talking about his crimes, he's actually talking about bad acting, bad theatrical acting. Oh, it offends me to the soul to see a robustious, periwig pated fellow tear a passion to tatters, to very rags, to split the ears of the groundlings, and so on. Um, well, okay, Hamlet might be a little bit of a diva and an artsy type. Um, so he might think, oh yeah, theatre is as, as important as life. But you wouldn't expect uh, Claudius, the pragmatic, the murderer, to be bothered about offence in theatre. And yet he is. In the middle of the performance that is then going to find him out, he asks Hamlet, have you heard the argument? Is there no offence in it? No, 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 they but just poison in jest, no offense in the word. Obviously, Hamlet is both telling the truth and lying. There is no offense in the play because it's a play, nobody gets really killed, so there is no crime. But there is offense, it will offend Claudius very deeply. And as we can see very soon after, um, it exposes Claudius's guilt, and he uh, later on 
only to himself um, in a soliloquy admits, oh, my offense is wrong, it smells to heaven, it has the primal eldest curse upon it, a brother's murder. So the performance offends him, shakes up his feelings, and leads to him admitting his offense, so his, his crime. Uh, and in this, um, I would like to argue, uh, Hamlet follows the um, precept that uh, Philip Sidney has laid down for tragedy in his treatise, A Defense of Poetry. Tragedy, according to Sidney, openeth the greatest wounds, showeth forth the ulcers that are covered with tissue, maketh kings fear to be tyrants, and tyrants manifest their tyrannical humors, and with stirring the effects of admiration and commiseration, teacheth the uncertainty of this world. So it arouses emotions to uh, get to the bottom of problems within society, which would otherwise remain hidden. Which is, I think, what we are also seeing with the issue of offense. So enough of Hamlet. Uh, now I'll move on to a couple of recent cases when Shakespearean performance offended somebody. The first one is from the UK. It happened in 2016 when the RSC uh, produced the big gala for Shakespeare's quarter centenary. And in it, they used a speech which is known as the uh, immigration speech from the uh, collaboratively written early modern play Sir Thomas More, in which More defends um, immigrants coming to, to England from the locals who would, um, who would harm them and violently exp uh, violently um, throw them out. Um, after that uh, was aired on the BBC, very quickly there was a backlash. Um, so the, that's a shot from, um, from Express. Outrage as BBC bosses use Shakespeare to pr push pro-BBC agenda. Uh, sorry, pro-immigration agenda. The BBC is battling new accusations of bias. Um, one of the uh, conservative um, MPs, Peter Bone, uh, made a point of it. Uh, Express and other newspapers commented on it. Um, and then there were, there were some responses on, not Expresses, but on uh, Mail's um, online uh, comment section, which um, I will show you a few of just to, just to um, see where, uh, which areas um, these uh, respondents um, engaged with, which is quite interesting. Um, so some responses, shut down the BBC now. So first, you know, attack the BBC, which was quite interesting because it wasn't actually a BBC program, it was RSC, BBC only broadcasted, but uh, still. Every day, it seems there are more and more horror stories, uh, Marxist cabal, uh, left-wing anti-British propaganda, um, and so on and so forth. BBC, as you will all know, equals British Bolshevik Corporation. There were some people who were also saying British, um, sorry, um, British Brussels Corporation, because it was in the run-up to the to the referendum, so it was seen as as being pro-Europe. Uh, the attack at the uh, at the bottom, I won't even read it. It's kind of quite. Um, I quite like the name of the guy who posted it, Crispy Duck from the Midlands. Um, so uh, some of them were just straightforward attacks saying, uh, let's defund the BBC, let's close the BBC. But some of them were actually um, engaging with Shakespeare, or in some ways with Shakespeare. First of all, they were saying, uh, this is not real Shakespeare, what you are showing. Strange, the BBC have chosen a piece that Shakespeare never used. Well, Shakespeare never used it. Uh, the play was not performed during Shakespeare's time because it was censored. So it was forbidden to be uh, to be um, performed. Um, and there is debate whether Shakespeare wrote that fragment or not, but still, um, this was something that uh, rankled people. You are giving us not authentic, not real Shakespeare. And as you can see from Sue 100 in Rochester, uh, William Shakespeare, eh? This is William Shakespeare. This England never did nor never shall lie at the proud foot of a conqueror. So suddenly, um, as a counterpoint to that uh, extract, they brought out another extract, which is say, that's true Shakespeare, that's the real Shakespeare, that's Shakespeare the Patriot. And this um, Mr. Trillionaire from Newcastle upon Tyne actually even produced a bit of a literary analysis of this, of this patriotic 
um, speech as it applies to, uh, to now. So um, the, uh, England is the fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war. No medical checks required, TB, etc. With, with the immigrants coming in. Um, as a moat defensive to a house, government no longer defends the moat against the envy of less happier lands. No need to be envious any longer, they just move here. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, and that's losing the plot. So um, as you can see, there is engagement with, with Shakespeare specifically on the level of what is real Shakespeare and what is not real Shakespeare. Some other responses were um, slightly different, like these um, two on, on this slide. One guy, the M. Hills 1345 from Worcester, says, oh, I always hated Shakespeare anyway, and this, this um, use of him just confirms it and makes it even worse. But one person, the um, anonymous person, uh, actually says Shakespeare has been uh, used to usurp um, real patriotism. So the previous guys were using the Richard II quotation to say the real Shakespeare is patriotic. Whereas uh, this person is saying, actually, you know, Shakespeare is just being used as a smokescreen. It was St. George's Day. It should be a public holiday, not because of Shakespeare, which I presume was made a big fuss of to exclude St. George's Day. The Queen could easily have made it a public holiday in honor of her reign, St. George's Day, for the English. So Shakespeare suddenly becomes competition to Englishness. He can be either a guarantee of patriotism or quite, quite the opposite. So as you can see, um, different responses. First, um, straightforward attacks and uh, asking for, uh, let's stop paying the license for the BBC, but also uh, debates on what is and what isn't Shakespeare and why Shakespeare should or should not be um, special for, particularly for, for the British. Um, but at least this, this case, uh, obviously it feeds to, um, to ongoing debate about defunding the BBC in particular, but it, it did not produce any, in itself, it didn't produce any big uh, immediate effects. So as far as, I'm cons as, as far as I know, there were no threats against the BBC or RSC or um, nobody uh, defunded those institutions because of that case. Whereas my next case, um, coming from the USA, actually had a more immediate um, effect, uh, kind of more solid effects um, on the lives of those who were involved in it. And that's the uh, case of uh, the um, notorious now uh, production of Julius Caesar in uh, Central Park in New York, in which uh, Caesar was made deliberately to look like Donald Trump it was performed in 2017, so not long after inauguration of, of Trump as the US president. And um, the outrage that it um, occasioned, um, I'll just have a, I'll show you first, first hand uh, example of it from Fox and Friends, which I think summarizes it better than I could do. And then I'll look at a few more comments after that. Well, a disgusting New York City play depicting the president brutally assassinated, all while being funded with your taxpayer dollars. Yeah, we've been covering this all morning. Here to weigh in, Fox News contributor and town hall political editor Guy Benson. Good morning, Guy. So we'll Good get morning. some of the facts out here up front. This is Shakespeare in the Park. It's partially taxpayer funded. It also has corporate sponsors. And this play, which is about Julius Caesar, uh, portrays someone who they don't say it's President Trump. But in, in the images, you can tell they're trying to depict someone who looks like President Trump. And all those attacking him and knifing him are uh, either minorities or women. What statement are they making here and how inappropriate is it? Well, it's not a subtle statement. And it's so basically, um, the people objected to this per performance on the grounds of it um, directly depicting and attacking um, the, the U.S. president. Uh, that's just uh, another um, illustration of that from uh, Breitbart News. Um, what uh, the responses were were actually slightly different to those in the British case I just discussed. They, most of them were actually engaging very much with Shakespeare, but rather with the specific 
political impact of that particular performance. Um, so, so they weren't saying, oh, but real Shakespeare does not show presidents being assassinated. They, they didn't really go into that, that type of argument. They just basically went and said, you must not show um, presidents being assassinated. And um, as you will see on the next slide, the responses to it were, um, came from mostly three areas. First, um, threats and um, demands to ban the play. I hope the next protests come with a bang. If the actors are going to kill Trump on stage, maybe they should be killed. Um, the next one, uh, I'm not going to read it, it's a bit rude, but um, the, the last uh, sentence of it, you and your shit director should be in prison for hate crimes and threats against the president. So the first one were direct protests and direct threats against um, the producers. The second, second type of response was actually ev evoking the law. You should be in jail, in prison for hate crimes. And the third one was quite interesting. Um, basically, very straightforward uh, calls about funding of that play. And you've seen it on Fox and Friends as well. The thing that seemed to be rankling most was, was it taxpayer uh, funded? So uh, Donald Trump Jr. Uh, asked if, how much of this art is funded by tax taxpayers? When does art become political speech? And then um, very quickly, Delta Airlines and the Bank of America pulled out sponsorship of the, uh, uh, of the event. And uh, Mike Huckabee, um, commended Delta for that. Um, no one should sponsor crap like that. So basically those three areas, direct threats, um, threats of the brush with the law and threats which actually materialized of um, defunding. Um, the direct threats um, extended to um, also to personal threats to life and um, well-being of the actors, uh, which fortunately did not materialize. But, um, but basically what, um, what this case shows is that indeed, you know, people who talk about offense being um, dangerous and bad, maybe they have a point. You know, maybe we should ban offense because it leads to very extreme responses, um, including death threats. So before we say, oh, yeah, it's kind of going a bit far, what I want to say is that people who argue that are in a very good company. It's not just a modern phenomenon. Um, Plato, in his Republic, actually argues that um, theatrical poets or dramatic poets should actually be excluded from a well-governed Republic, so uh, from a well-ordered Commonwealth, because such a poet stimulates and strengthens an element which threatens to undermine reason. Just like offense, exactly, uh, if, exactly what we were talking about earlier on. Um, dramatic poet sets up a vicious form of government in the individual soul. And obviously, if the individual soul is disordered, so is democracy. So, um, you know, we should, we should ban offense, we should ban the theater. Of course, Plato was not the only voice in this debate. Uh, very quickly, his, um, his pupil, Aristotle, said the opposite. Tragedy is the imitation of an action that is serious and also having magnitude complete in itself, with incidents arousing pity and fear, that is, emotions, wherewith to accomplish its catharsis of such emotions. So it's not just gratuitous evoking of emotions, but evoking emotions to do something with them. And catharsis is a notoriously ambiguous term. It could mean purgation, purification, transformation, and more. So maybe theater actually allows us to see things which we wouldn't normally see, and then transform things which are just raw feelings into something productive, dialogue, maybe something even, dare I say, to do with reason. So, um, so that's, um, that's the kind of state of, of play. And obviously, this, this debate did not end with Plato and Aristotle. As, as I've already shown you, the um, 
in Shakespeare's time, Philip Sidney uh, seems to be speaking for Aristotle, saying tragedy opens the wounds which would otherwise remain closed and shows things that we wouldn't see and allows you to engage with them and work through them. So deal with emotions rather than just evoke emotions. Um, and so the, the, the debates rumble on till now and uh, I'm sure will uh, we'll keep on rumbling. But I thought, you know, looking at um, maybe rather than panicking, that there is something weird about us that we are so obsessed with offence. Um, maybe we should be reassured this is an issue which has been very important to even such uh, foundational philosophers as Plato and Aristotle. And uh, what I would like to finish with is maybe a kind of suggestion that um, this the binary between emotion and reason um, might not be very helpful to us. That maybe we could actually start rethinking emotion. And I'm drawing here on um, uh, cultural critic Sarah Ahmed, um, who is talking about emotion um, as um, not, um, not just a psychological state, not just individual, not just um, unreasonable, but actually as social and cultural practice. So how we feel, how we react is embedded and conditioned by what we know. So it's also cognitive. It's got something to do with reason as well. It's influenced by other people. So the emotions are intentional and they are relational. They, uh, they deal with you and others, society. And they matter for politics. So emotion is a form of cultural politics or world making. And uh, Ahmed actually warns that if we... Um, if we forget this, if we just think, oh, emotion is just something that just naturally occurs, erupts, you have no control over it, it's unreasonable, you neglect the fact that it's, um, emotions are produced and that emotions um, are actually, to some extent, um, grounded in certain ways of thinking, ideological mechanisms that govern our societies, um, injustices, uh, prejudices, all, all sorts of things. So, so maybe, maybe if we if we do one thing, maybe we should start thinking about rather than panicking about emotion, thinking, okay, emotion and reason work side by side, and and we can do something with it. So, um, I think that's it from me. Thank you very much for listening, and if you'd like to continue the conversation, please feel free to email me. But uh, for now, I'll pass you on to Adam Hansen. Thank you, Monica. So as, uh, as, as Monica's discussion of Shakespeare's varied uses of offence showed, in some ways, um, Shakespeare is Mr. Offensive. Um, and again, I would say, in slightly ironic terms, my talk will contain uh, triggering instances, trigger warnings. Yeah, you can buy, uh, you can go online and find Shakespeare insult generators as up there. You can uh, buy bug, mugs uh, bedecked with some of his more memorable roasts and insults. Um, but rather than simply indulging in his obscenities, uh, what I'm going to do now is offer a, a kind of space to reflect on what his ability to offend and our capacity to be offended um, has in teaching and learning about Shakespeare. What, in other words, is at stake when we teach Shakespeare as or and offence. And like Monica, rather than being prescriptive or definitive, I will try to describe and analyse what we're doing, where we are, in thinking about Shakespeare, offence and teaching. And through this, I will try to address these key questions. Um, how and why might teaching Shakespeare cause offence and or improve our understanding of offence? And in what ways is Shakespeare in offensiveness useful or challenging, or perhaps useful because it's challenging for students? I'm going to begin with three case studies presenting some of the issues of teaching offensive Shakespeare. And as I do, I'll complicate these as, I, as I'm discussing them. And again, what I'm trying to do is, is map out the debate about what is happening with as much honesty and clarity as I can. I'm not trying to resolve disputes or offer conclusions. And in part, I'm doing this for my own benefit as much as anyone else's, because as a teacher of Shakespeare now, uh, I need to think about what I'm doing and why. I'll just say a word about the slides. The slides may look quite busy when, when, you, when you're looking at them. Um, quotes that I give will usually be the bits that are in bold on the slides. So if you're looking for what to focus on, that's what you should focus on. Okay, then. 
Picture the scene uh, a few years ago. I was ending a typically scintillating second year seminar with about 15 students on a module we at Northumbria call Early Modern Cultures. And this, this module puts Shakespeare and his contemporaries in historical context, past and present. So in a sense, we've been looking at Othello in its own time and in ours. And doing this involved me mentioning some reactionary responses to what was then the relatively new Black Lives Matter movement. Some of these responses from people like Steve Bannon, Donald Trump's erstwhile chief strategist, seem to recycle racist ideas about the supposedly inherently violent nature of African Americans. And so I was trying to set these ideas alongside what people in the play, like Iago, but maybe in time Othello himself, say about Othello's unstable and demonic identity. In other words, I was asking the students, should we see the play as a problem because it gives voice to prejudices and presumptions that still have power today? So to kick things off in this part of the seminar, I gave the students a quote about the play from the actor Hugh Quashy. I won't read it all out, which is the bit in bold, which is significant. And he asks, if a black actor plays Othello, does he not risk making racial stereotypes seem legitimate and even true? So I gave the students this quote, I split them into groups, asked them whether they agreed or disagreed with Quashi. But when the time came for the groups to feed back, uh, a white English and creative writing student said, I don't feel I can answer that. It is not my place to answer that. And they elaborated that they didn't feel they could know how black people might feel about this. They didn't want to be offensive to anyone by assuming they did. Now, I'd never done this in the seminar before and never have encountered this. I said, OK, and then we moved on. And actually, if I'm honest, the class seemed more animated by the play's gender politics than by its racial implications. But later, I thought about it a bit more and I thought the student was daft, or at least uh, deliberately trying to derail my meticulously designed seminar. Uh, you don't have to be Jewish to find parts of The Merchant of Venice an affront to humanity, I thought to myself. Maybe, I reflected with self-righteous grumbling, this is what Frank Ferredi, who Monica's already mentioned, what he detected in English undergraduates, a self-censorship, and this is on the slide there. It's a kind of internalised, politically correct policing of the kind that someone like Mick Hume, also on the slide, sees as an enemy of free speech. Now, for many, uh, an attack on free speech is an attack on the very idea of the liberal university. So in the 80s, Margaret Thatcher said, universities are places where, above all, free speech should be honoured, not prevented. Now, these concerns are not just philosophical or abstract or historical, but they reach to the current corridors of power and respond to an apparent crisis in education. So in 2018, the then university's minister, minister um, Sam Guillaume, expressed qualms very similar to Ferredi's and Hume's. He talked about a culture of censorship that's been creeping into universities. And he pointed to some of the things that Monica's already mentioned, no platforming, safe spaces, trigger warnings, etc. Now, it's worth pointing out, as Evan Smith does in this, in this wonderful book, uh, No Platform, that Sam Guillaume's predecessor as, as universities minister, Joe Johnson, launched a, a parliamentary inquiry into free speech into universities, uh, at universities, and he concluded that there was no threat. The, the threat to free speech in, on, in universities was highly exaggerated. Moreover, as Evan Smith has recently shown, um, students have for a long time been keen on challenging views they find offensive. And that challenge has included forms of censorship, such as no platforming. So in a sense, there's a, there's a long history, stretching all the way back at least to the 30s, of students um, mobilising themselves to say they don't like something that someone is saying and they think it, they should be stopped from saying it. Again, I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong, I'm saying there is a longer history of this, it's not some new phenomenon. Now, with that in mind, and um, not being someone naturally inclined to agree with conservative politicians of any era, on further reflection, I started to appreciate that maybe that student had a point and was actually being sensitive and smart, not naively adhering to some woke PC agenda. And if we think in the terms articulated by Ian Smith on the slide there, they were, however bluntly, problematising their own status. They were checking their privilege, unpacking their position as a white student, making their whiteness visible, undertaking a form of racial self-inquiry. And I think if I was given the chance to have that seminar again, I would do well to handle that better, both more sensitively and um, more critically. So experiences like this 
and working and thinking with Monica, started to sensitise me to how students and teachers could make more of these kinds of moments, to understand both Shakespeare and the world in which we're studying now. Now, I didn't have to wait long to encounter another um, example of this. So just down the road from my own institution, Durham University was working through its own issues with um, offensive Shakespeare, surrounding the use in Shakespeare teaching of what are known as trigger warnings. In this case, for the teaching of a play called Titus Andronicus. If you know the play, doubtless you will love it, but it's a play with rape, mutilation, brutality, inter-ethnic relationships. It's, it's, a, it's a riot. Um, so the Durham student newspaper reported things like this. They said, no one is saying that Titus Andronicus should be taken off the curriculum. What, they're saying, what, what they were saying was, we should use trigger warnings to give vulnerable people the choice to opt out of a potentially harmful discussion, while still leaving the topic open for those able to contribute. Now, this state of affairs uh, prompted much discussion from concerned commentators, taking the line of Claire Fox, who condemned this kind of thing as privileging subjective interpretation, um, as it says on the slide there. It's a case of students saying, I don't want to do this, you can't make me do this, if you try and make me, that's a microaggression. For Frank Ferredi, again, these kinds of scenes indicate a repressive silencing, uh, a complete misunderstanding of, of, of um, the wonderful aesthetic experience that is Shakespeare. And, and it's a misunderstanding because Shakespeare is meant to upset you. So Ferredi talks about um, Shakespeare you know, meant, is meant to provoke emotional upheavals. That's part of the effect of reading Shakespeare. Now, of course, we might counter, what is anything we do if not subjective interpretation? Indeed, most marking criteria for students' work privilege subjectivity. In other words, students are meant to showcase their originality and universities reward it. So we can't condemn them for doing that. Equally, we might argue that emotional upheaval is not really a guarantee of a wonderful experience. If you are really upset by it, you are really feeling it, but that doesn't necessarily make it wonderful. And certainly this is how the seminal Shakespearean and philosopher of censorship and desire, Jonathan Dolimore, felt on reading Othello in, in his younger days while going through various psychological crises. And he said, Othello made too much sense to me, so much so that I could no longer even read it. There's a kind of censorship there. Dolimore confesses he could not carry on reading. But this is an intense response to, rather than a petulant dismissal of Shakespeare's work, and for good reason. Clearly, we censor what we think has power. Now, maybe this means we need to find another way to engage with what disturbs us, and, and maybe trigger warnings are one way to do this. There are others, perhaps. Uh, I know I and, and many other university tutors use something like rules of um, engagement. These are from a module I teach on Shakespeare's contemporary, Christopher Marlowe. I won't read you it all out, it's just excerpts. But basically, I, I suggest to the students that, um, you know, we need to be aware that we're going to uh, encounter controversial and challenging ideas. Um, we need to prime ourselves for that. But we also need to be able to think and argue in different directions, as indeed Marlowe was taught to think and argue. My third case study from Cambridge is, is like Durham's, but is especially notable for the publicity it generated. So this is from uh, a report in The Telegraph. Trigger warnings were printed alongside the description of at least one English literature lecture and one seminar due to take place this term, focusing particularly on Shakespeare's The Comedy of Errors and Titus Andronicus. There's that play again. Um, now, initial responses to the publication of this report in the comments section online to this version of the article were, how to put it, hyperbolic, to say the least. Um, some people said, you know, took this as evidence that the Age of Enlightenment is over. Uh, some people took this to, to mean there's some kind of epochal shift had occurred. History shows that when civilizations become too soft, they often disappear. Again, we hear about the continued assault on free speech emanating from cultural Marxists. And then someone point, uh, raised the question, I bet that these poor little darlings all have box sets of Games of Thrones. Do those carry a trigger warning? Yes, they do, actually. But anyway, uh, in turn, these responses triggers other responses in the comics set comments section, which criticised that hyperbole, that, that kind of hyperbolic reaction. Someone suggested the Telegraph itself should carry a trigger warning. Someone made the great joke, and I've tried to mimic it a little bit here with the picture, that even Roy Rogers films come with trigger warnings now. Apologies for that. Um, the really interesting one came from someone who said they were a Cambridge student. 
They say trigger warnings are just that, a warning. It's no different from having a content warning on a movie. They're not to dissuade and censor. That's not what they're there for. Now, I think this comment, this final comment, is vital because it sets out how something like a trigger warning about potentially offensive Shakespearean material is actually a way to open up and facilitate debate. And I'll return to this point presently. In the meantime, building on what we've already heard, I will overlay what we've seen in these case studies with the following observations. Firstly, uh, teaching has always been subject to conditions, controls, censorship, interventions, and silencing. There's a long tradition of this. If you go back to the 1700s, uh, sorry, the 1600s, you've got Pufendorf saying, you know, teachers should not teach that which tends to disturb civil society. So there are constraints imposed upon teaching. There always have been. Free speech has been subject to constraints too. In even, and we, we hear this even in exemplary instances of, uh, or declarations of freedom, such as this from Revolutionary France in 1789. Every citizen may speak, write and publish freely, provided he is responsible for the abuse of liberty in cases determined by the law. So there's no absolute free speech even then in that moment of kind of uh, a rediscovery of, of the, 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 or an opening up of the franchise of expression. Literature too obviously has been subject to um, conditions and controls and that includes literature. I think this quote from A.C. Bradley in his very, very influential Shakespearean tragedy from the early 1900s is, is really interesting. He doesn't want to talk about Titus Andronicus. He says, I'll leave that out of account, because even if Shakespeare wrote the whole thing, he did so before he had either a style of his own or any characteristic tragic conception. What Bradley is doing is discounting or, or, or we might say, silencing a play. He's doing it on the grounds of Shakespeare's artistic immaturity. That's the reason he's giving. But I wonder, is it a coincidence that he's doing that with a play which we now teach to students and, and features, as I said, rape, mutilation and inter-ethnic relationships. It's a play that so many students now study with or without trigger warnings or indeed pleasure. Thinking of trigger warnings, the last observation I make at this point is that we have to, have, we have to understand that, that trigger warnings, and there's another silly one, trigger for money, fools and horses, apologies again, have unclear effects. And there's a really interesting psychological study done on this, um, which I'm citing here by Benjamin Bellet. Um, and what this did was it, it randomly assigned literary passages varying in potentially disturbing content to online participants. And it gave some of those participants trigger warnings and said, you, what you're about to read, you may find disturbing. It didn't give trigger warnings to other people. Now, what the researchers were trying to do was explore the view that we hear a lot that trigger warnings hamper academic inquiry, coddle students, undermine their preparation for the real world. Now, they did find that they thought trigger warnings weren't that good for participants' resilience. That's what their study seemed to suggest. But they also found that trigger warnings probably also don't really affect people who don't already have some kind of uh, traumatic uh, aspect of their identity or an aspect of their identity that causes trauma. Um, so in, in, in other words, the jury is out on, on the, the, the usefulness or the problems of using trigger warnings. But another way of, of thinking about trigger warnings and how they might have an impact on how we teach and learn about Shakespeare is to historicise their use. And perhaps we can see a, a prehistory for trigger warnings built into the works of Shakespeare and his contemporaries. So think about it like this. Um, countless plays for the early modern stage or page feature prologues or epilogues that condition audiences' responses. They beg for applause, they genuflect to the audience to ensure no one is offended. Now, this made good business sense and showed political acumen in an age of censorship and book burning, where theatres were commercial concerns relying on our, um, aristocratic patronage. But this version of what we call a kind of humility topos often verges on self-parody and could be used to criticise those forces which would presume to contain or censure a playwright's wit. Now, we can see this self-conscious parody of the desire to avoid causing offence within plays as well, like A Midsummer Night's Dream. And this small excerpt I've given you here is, is just before the Rude Mechanical's final performance in that play. And Quince, as the prologue says, if we offend, it is with our good will that you should think. We come not to offend, but with good will. To show our simple skill, that is the true beginning of our end. And I wonder, can we read this as an early modern trigger warning? 
We've got this ambiguous punctuation after the, after the first line there. Does the, does the line run on as it does in some editions or is it stopped after will? Um, what is it that we should think? You know, that you should think. What, what is Quint saying that we should think? Do or don't the players mean to offend? If they don't mean to offend, they simply mean to evoke goodwill, make you feel good. If they do mean to offend, yes, they mean to do that, but they also mean to do so, but with goodwill. So there's a purpose to that offence. With his wordplay as well, Quint signals and queries intention when he talks about our end, you know, the, the end that he aims at. But he's also trying to condition and complicate audience response. He also introduces conditionality itself. He says, if we offend. So offence is not a given, but it depends on subjective responses. And we're back to that idea of privileging subjective interpretation. Quint says paradoxes when he talks about the true beginning of our end. Highlight the oxymoron of simple skill. This is very simple and skillful language. It's, it's silly, it's banal, it's profound, it's powerful and weak, just like a playwright themselves. So maybe Shakespeare then saw the ironies of trying to both protect and provoke those he sought to enlighten. But when it comes to those now trying to enlighten others about Shakespeare through teaching an offence, what then is the state of play? So I'll move now to a kind of conclusion by looking at a couple of recent approaches to recognising offence in the Shakespearean classroom and for mobilising offence as something possible or useful for students. So I've, I've put up the image here of James Stredder's book. If you don't know it, it's, it's a really great book for setting out his ideas for the active Shakespearean classroom. He, he, he incorporates lots of techniques from drama teaching. It's a very physical approach. There's lots of moving around the room and not students being sat in their chairs, etc. Now, Stredder notes, when you're doing anything physical in the classroom, there are health and safety implications attached to that. But in this excerpt here, he suggests that these implications are not just for our physical well-being, but also for areas of the mind and the emotions too. And these can focus on offence in the classroom. He says, personal memory may be touched very painfully for a particular individual, causing an unexpected and unwelcome breaking out of feeling. Now, what's important about what Strader does with this recognition is he says, well, I'm not going to shy away from that. I'm going to use that in the classroom. So he sees the potential risks, but also the benefits of bringing offence into Shakespeare teaching. And this is what he says at the bottom of the slide there. He says, the potentially negative effects of such rare incidents, um, well, we have to withstand the potentially negative effects of such rare incidents and quite possibly turn them into positive experiences. And one of the examples that he gives of that is insult games. You know, Shakespeare's plays are full of insults, um, people arguing with each other, shouting at each other. Um, you can use that in the classroom to uh, animate students, to get them to think about, well, what's at stake in being offensive or being offended? I have equal admiration for the work of Ayana Thompson and Laura Turchi. And they say, they say that um, the purpose of teaching Shakespeare's plays is to increase a student's familiarity with complex texts. And they're going to argue that through engaging with complex texts, like Shakespeare's, people can find a way to talk about complex issues, particularly around identity. And they say, if we don't do this, we diminish Shakespeare and we also ignore what matters about ourselves in relation to others. So in a recent webinar on teaching Shakespeare, um, Thompson and Turchie explained their aspirations and their concerns in relation to events like the Black Lives Matter movement. And they started to ask the question, whether Shakespeare might be compared to the kinds of statues of problematic historical figures that some in the movement have in their sights and want to pull down. So they asked, you know, is Shakespeare as a, as a quintessential dead white male at risk of being pulled down too? Now they raised this question not out of a desire to cause that particular iconoclasm, but to prevent it. And not out of a desire to condemn the movements that see the need for making statues fall, but in profound fellowship with them. And this is what they said in the webinar. If we don't have a way to talk to our students and to make the learning of Shakespeare coincide with the learning of truth, then it's done. In other words, learning about Shakespeare is doomed. Shakespeare does allow us to talk about race, and as we'll see, other things as well, in truthful ways. Now, just as Stredder did, um, they recognised that doing this kind of complex engagement with, with complex texts, texts risks being seen to give offence. But again, like Streda, Thompson and Turchie see this as a risk worth taking to keep Shakespeare alive 
and to show what matters about the lives of those talking about him. And so they say, you know, where better to talk about complex identity issues than through complex texts? Um, if rich differences among students are ignored, um, those differences become unmentionable and irre irrelevant. So they're not saying uh, obscure difference, they're saying use it, uh, highlight it, recognise it. If you don't, you end up silencing difference and everything that it entails. So as I say, um, Thompson and Turchie recognise the risks and opportunities of offence in the Shakespearean classroom, and they give some examples of how it might work. So they say students preparing scripts for classroom performance may be tempted to edit out or otherwise de-emphasise troubling lines. They say at the bottom there, um, advanced learners m might like being given the opportunity to edit Shakespeare themselves. Um, but what they also say is if you're doing that with students, well, why not also get them to think about how theatre companies, editors and politicians have all edited Shakespeare for the same reason. So in a sense, the students aren't doing something that radical or that new. People have been doing this for a long time. I think these are really inspiring but also suggestive assertions. And I, and I would ask the question, and it's an open question, is this kind of approach empowering or not for staff or students? What matters here, though, is the way that they're kind of using longer histories of understanding Shakespeare as offensive and as censored, and how these can be brought to bear on current understandings of his problematic power. This is an approach built on openness and on transparency. It's teachers saying with, not just to students, that this is what we're doing with Shakespeare and why. So they use the idea of uh, the seminar as a safe space where we can have these discussions, but this isn't to shut down debate or, or destroy Shakespeare. Instead, we have to acknowledge that the potential for bad choices and significant discomfort, and indeed the risk of offence, could occur as people grapple with challenging issues. But we have to do this. We have to go through this process in order to ask questions about race, gender, ability, sexuality, I would say also class, without fear of censorship. Um, and in the recent webinar, Thompson and Turchie uh, embraced or emphasise this embrace of offence as a tool for teaching in very precise, practical terms. And I've been using this term mobilising offence, but they, they think of it in terms of how the students' minds, the students' thought process might be mobilised, changed. So they said, someone saying something that may be offensive at the beginning of the semester and then moving his or her thinking throughout the semester is okay. I do like to say that there are going to be times when we all say something that offends everybody else or somebody else, and this, the seminar, is precisely the place where you should do it, because this is the place where we're meant to learn together. I love that approach. As you can see, I'm a bit of a Thompson and Turchie fanboy. Uh, their progressive pedagogy is all about debate and inclusion. It's about drawing on the identities of learners to help them understand what's going on beyond, as well as within the classroom, in our urgent now. And their pedagogy is also about using and reinvigorating Shakespeare to do this. When people read Shakespeare, they read themselves. But that's a truth evident in many periods and contexts. And if we can't read ourselves in or through Shakespeare, then we won't read him. Their approach fits well with the model of learning English, which is all about critical literacy in the bottom corner there. Um, so that's where we're asking questions, not just about texts, but about our communities, about our culture, about society in general. We're reading the world critically as we read texts critically. But in an attempt to be critically literate ourselves and deepen our reflections, might we see some problems with Thompson and Turchie's approach? Um, firstly, clearly Shakespeare has been put to work in forming the many political persuasions that people also use to read themselves, from fascism to communism, nationalism to post-colonialism. So while we're aiming for progressive outcomes, the, the challenge remains, what if Shakespeare doesn't change but emboldens the white supremacist in your, sem in your seminar group? Moreover, emphasising the present-day value of something, especially uh, thinking or, or, or teaching or learning about a complex problem, is vital. But it also poses a risk, even if you're doing this for progressive ends. To put this another way, Thompson and Turchie want to help students use Shakespeare to understand themselves, but also because they need the skills for employment in the 21st century, as they say. We have to ask the question then, does this reduce the study of Shakespeare to what the UK government called on the slide there, the acquisition of transferable work readiness skills that, that employers need. 
um, because employers need an access to a pipeline of graduates. That's the UK government. What the UK government says about what higher education should do is echoed in any number of documents on higher education globally. Um, lots of documents like this one here um, from Ernst & Young talks about higher education turning learners into complex problem-solving and decision-making individuals prepared for people management. So if we learn cognitive flexibility, as it has it here, uh, by giving and taking offence in the Shakespeare classroom, we can learn how to manage people in complex organisations. We can uh, learn to work with people from different cultures and places. We can't allow offence to derail productivity. We need to be taught to be sensitive so the wheels of commerce can keep going. Now, this corresponds with another, I would argue, more reductive, more instrumental model of learning English, English as skills up there, which is less about discovery and more about adhering to authority. As we've seen, though, alternatives are possible. Alternatives are always possible. There's always an alternative. Not least, finally, in the form of the idea of the student as a citizen scholar. Not my words, the words from uh, Avanitakis and Hornsby. They talk about a citizen scholar as a student who cares not only about gaining information and generating knowledge, but one who's rooted in their context and is interested in applying their knowledge for the betterment of society. Thompson and Turchie, I think, subscribe to this view. It's far, mu far much more than they would do to the kind of instrumental skills model. And they talk about using Shakespeare's complex texts as a way to help students understand all complex discourses and debates in society. Now, given the contradictions we're in, critical literacy to understand uh, these complex discourses has, has never been more necessary. Our students, the students I will be teaching very soon, are enmeshed in a set of, of very challenging contradictions that we need to work with them to work through. In a neoliberal world, how can we be both self-interested consumers and entrepreneurs and socially conscious citizens? How can our students? Another complex contradiction that we and our students need to be able to read critically derives from the marketising of higher education in the liberal university. If students are consumers, and universities really are, as some neoliberal ideologues would suggest, a marketplace of ideas that cannot countenance censorship, then why shouldn't students get what they pay for? And to put this in very simple terms and link it back to offence, who would pay to be offended? Who would pay to be in an unsafe space? Finally, if people seem concerned by a culture of microaggressions, you know, woke students, snowflakes, calling out abuse, might we read that culture as a response to what Ira Wells calls a politics of macroaggression? This macroaggression in the wider world has dominated the last few years in the US and beyond, in the face of merciless globalised forces, we have populists reacting by telling us to take back control. Well, what is woke culture but a comparable attempt at taking back control of the political realm from the worst excesses of populism? Now, I can't answer these questions or, or, or resolve these contradictions here, but, but I will end um, with this point. As we've seen, many of us are aware of the role uh, thinking about offence can play in helping students become citizen scholars because it can encourage a crucial part of that identity, cultural humility. And cultural humility relies upon being committed to self-evaluation and self-critique, uh, relies upon people desiring to address and change power imbalances. And it also involves, as the slide says, asking the question, might I be offending? Now, asking that question is not about censorship or silencing, but it's about dialogue and deep respect. This is not a world away from where I and we began, with that moment where a white student of mine said they didn't feel they could talk about black responses to Othello. Now, I might see such moments as a way to discuss, for example, being white, what whiteness means, as much as it is to understand blackness and being black. So, in a spirit of accepting my own cultural humility and knowing what I now know, I am a world away from letting go again of the chance to make much more of such moments. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Hansen and Dr. Schmelkowska. Um, I have some questions from our online audience for you. Quite a lot of questions. We may not get through them all, but um, we can do our best. Um, first question, do you think Shakespeare himself was aiming to give offence, or at least a shock, or cause controversy in his own society, perhaps in order to create publicity for his plays? Simple answer, 
Absolutely. Yeah, because you know, he's operating in a, in a commercial sphere. It's a very competitive sphere. He's on the heels of someone like Marlowe, who made a career out of uh, sensational, offensive performances and, and offensive texts. Um, but obviously, he's got a very, it's a very fine line to tread because you don't want to give offence to the wrong people and, and end up being shut down. But, but equally, um, and, and, and also audiences wanted a certain degree of familiarity. They didn't want things that were completely alien to them. But, but a, a playwright such as Shakespeare, or indeed Marlowe, would find, was adept at finding a way to shift people's expectations a little bit. And, and, and being offensive was one way to do that. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's offensive to all sorts of people. Isn't he? Uh, the French, for example, or, uh, you know, arguably, you could easily read the plays as being offensive to Catholics, and that would play to certain audiences. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I think the simple answer is yes, he was trying to give offence, but within very kind of constrained senses of that. It was al almost like a kind of tightrope walking, really. You know, you want, to, you want people to be interested, so you need to offend a little bit, but you don't want to offend to the extent that they will chop off your ears like they've, or, you know, brand you with hot iron, which uh, didn't happen to Shakespeare, but happened to Ben Johnson. Yeah. Um, so, not for offence, but for murdering someone, but uh, still, you know, if, if you offended too much and the wrong people, there were very serious consequences. I think that just to, as, as well to add to that, I think as Monica showed and even that little bit from Midsummer Night's Dream showed, the fact that he incorporates discussion of it into the plays shows that he is aware he's, he's having to negotiate and navigate this very tricky, tricky terrain, but that it was worth doing. I've got two quite specific questions about two of the plays. Um, the first one, uh, Eno Barbus in Antony and Cleopatra expresses some perhaps misogynistic views of women. Is this just a modern view or more typical of his day? And second question, was Elizabeth offended by the play Richard II, which features a plot against a king? Well, second, second question. Uh, quick answer, yes, she was. She said, actually, explicitly, she said, don't you know I am Richard? Uh, it was around the, around the time of Essex Rebellion, Rebellion yeah. which was kind of, um, to some extent, pe some people argue, was instigated by that performance. Well, I mean, not instigated, but kind of triggered? No, not triggered, what's the word? <laughs> it, or, Informed almost, by. Yeah, almost like, like it was a signal, you know, that the performance of Richard II was uh, a deposed king, uh, was a signal to, to rally around the Essex cause. Um, the first question, if I could come in on that one, um, so, so is, is you know, Barbus's misogyny or indeed misogyny in general in Shakespeare, is, are we just imposing a modern reading on that or would it have been seen as misogynist in its own time, or misogynistic in its own time? One of the brilliant things about in the past sort of 30 years of early modern studies or Renaissance studies has been the rediscovery of, uh, of, of a lot of forgotten female authors. And when, when that really, one of the consequences of that rediscovery is you see people arguing against misogyny in their own time. So it wasn't like there was just one discourse that was, that, that was, that was licensed and was allowed. There are plenty of female authors arguing against that. And indeed, female characters in the plays argue against that. There was a strong tradition, obviously, in the period of, of, of misogyny, the Corel de Femmes discourses of, of you know, all the bad things that women, that women do. But... Um, one, of the, one of the guys we use quite a lot in our teaching is a chap called Helkaya Crook, and he basically says, you know, women are inferior to men, uh, men need to control their women, etc., etc., etc. The reason he's saying this is because, it's probably because, out of desperation, <laughs> that women were not easily controlled, and so in a sense, it, what produces the misogyny is reality, which is uh, a, a much more kind of disturbed, unstable gen gender politics than, than we might imagine. But, but to know that, you've got to look back at the period and see what, what else people were writing. So again, that, that rediscovery of female authors is so important to help us do that. But also, it's, it's quite difficult to answer you know, what, um, what Shakespeare intended and what, it's, what we read into, into plays now. And I would recommend slightly cheekily uh, watching this brilliant BBC series, Upstart Crawl in which basically it's, it's, very, it's, it's about Shakespeare, but it's very much modern take on Shakespeare. And very often um, Shakespeare gets challenged from a very modern um, point of view. And 
uh, when he's writing um, Taming of the Shrew, uh, the, the feminist um, acquaintance of his challenges him, and he says, oh, oh, but you do understand that, um, you know, I'm, I'm saying that ironically. Which is, are you really saying that ironically, Master Shakespeare, or are you just thinking that maybe sometime later, in a few hundred years' time, some scholars will start arguing that you wrote that ironically to undermine that misogyny? So I think it's a kind of how long is a piece of string argument. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go on to the next question. How could you present offence through the play Othello? Are there any similarities with it to Hamlet? Well, I mean, the play opens with, an, with, with a, a stream of what we would, I would imagine most people would now describe as racist invective from Iago. Um, and that is written into the very, um, the very sound of the words the rhythm of the words is meant to have an impact on, on the audience. So when he's saying, you know, um, when he's talking about a U, E-W-E, that's being tupped, um, that, there's, there's a homophone there with you, the audience. You are being assaulted sexually by this, by this demonic black man. Um, so, you know, that is there in the play. The extent to which... Othello then internalises that, is something also to debate. But, and it goes back to the previous question. These plays function through their ambiguity. So even though you get that, you might get that voice, it's not the only voice. And it, again, it wouldn't, be, wouldn't make commercial sense or political sense to, to offer only one perspective. What you want is a, is a multiplicity of views. If people wanted one perspective, they'd go to church. They're not in church, they're not in work, they're not in school, they're in the theatre. And from that, they can get a, a multitude of views. And um, so, yeah, you can absolutely read it like that and see how it works on someone, but you can also... The, the fact that we can see that shows that it's open to critique as well. And a very similar case to, to Hamlet, when you think about um, what does offence mean? Has Desdemona offended? Well, she clearly hasn't in a sense of she didn't commit adultery, but yet Othello is offended. So where is the offence? Is it in the eye of the beholder? So again, pull out. I think actually the word offence uh, occurs the same number of times in Othello as in Hamlet. I haven't analysed the, the Othello case, but it would be interesting to have, a, uh, to have a look at that one as well. So I'm sure it can be analysed in a very similar way. Great. Um, and do you think the acting out of insult heightens the offence? For example, spitting at Shylock, removing Gloucester's eyes on stage or assaulting women? Yeah. Um, as I was coming down, I was thinking about one of Shakespeare contemporaries, Ben Johnson, and his play The Alchemist. And that does begin with about 30 or 40 lines of just insults being hurled between two characters. So, uh, I'm, I was trying to remember the most, uh, the most memorable ones, and there's one about, some, he says, some, one, someone says to another character, you were taking in, you were so poor, you were taking in your meal of steam, that you had nothing to eat except the steam from a pie shop. Um, but... but the way Johnson stages that, and I think the way Shakespeare does it as well, particularly that, that opening scene of something like Othello, or you might say the opening scene of Romeo and Juliet, where you've got a lot of insults, is it's the physicality of it, the speed of it, has to be performed. When, it, when, it, when, it, when it's written, you can get a sense of it. But, the, the, you know, when we use fricatives now. We use plosives now for, for effect. Think of all our favourite swear words. They start with the letters they do to have, a, to have an effect, and it's not dissimilar to how these plays function. And so hearing that, seeing someone, as, as the questioner said, spitting out the words, really in, does intensify their impact, yeah. And also embodying the, the, the language. I, I remember a very disturbing um, performance of The Taming of the Shrew uh, by The Propeller, which is an all-male um, company, and uh, it's supposed to be a comedy. It's supposed to end up in reconciliation. It's supposed to, to be all lovely. But in that particular performance, when, uh, when Katerina delivers that sp speech at the end, saying, oh, you know, I'm all now converted. Uh, you know, I, I, I willingly put, uh, would put my hand down uh, for, for my husband to tread on. The Petruchio character actually went and did. I mean, not literally, I hope, because the poor actor would have broken hands, but it was actually, he took it literally. It wasn't like, oh yeah, how lovely she is now all. So it actually brought back the, the misogyny, which supposedly the comedic um, 
ending is supposed to kind of smooth over and say, oh yeah, women actually like that kind of stuff. And that, that performance really, I was quite, quite shaken. I wasn't it's, laughing. It sounds extraordinary. Um, what reasons, if any, were given by the master of the Queen's revels for the banning or censorship of Shakespeare's plays? When was the ban lifted? Well, Thomas More, if, if we see, let's not call that a Shakespeare play because it was collaborative. The, the reason that, well, as far as we understand, one of the reasons that wasn't performed was to do with the risk of inciting riot uh, amongst apprentices in London who were engaged in xenophobic activity. So it, sometimes it was to do with public order. Um, I mean, he's, he's, he's not the only person to be subject to, to censorship. And you have events like 1599 Bishop's Ban, where works by Marlowe and others, not plays, but, but poems and satires were burnt. Um, this, this, this was part of the culture, I think. Um, yeah. I, I can't actually think of any specific Shakespeare play that we definitely know was banned no. by, by the Master of the Revels. There were... Uh, there were um, breaks in performance times ostensibly due to the, due to the plague, yeah. which some critics argue might have been strategic to some extent as well. If, it was, if there was a, um, a risk of some sort of disturbances, you could just say, oh, well, plague, you know, COVID-19, stay at home. Um, but uh, I can't think of a Shakespeare play of the, that, that actually got banned. No. Um, Johnson... Yeah, the, the Isle of Dogs. Yeah, yeah, other people were subject o to it. Other people, but I don't know if Shakespeare was milder or cleverer, but he kind of managed to avoid it, I think. Yeah. Next question. Is it probable that the original current insults in the plays were dropped at later reruns as outdated and replaced by then current references, which therefore never made it into print? Ah, so the, to the printed versions, the oldest printed versions, were there other insults within there? That's a really interesting question. Um, we, we, I'm not sure we'd know. <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the, the versions of the plays we have are kind of snapshots in time. Um, they're not necessarily... Well, actors would have been subject to all kind of ad-libs and improvisation and playing with things on stage, so particularly in to, in to do with the topicality of some of the insults, I'm sure they would have brought... Them. Again, I'm thinking of Johnson. There's lots of topical insults in his plays um, that, that now you, read, you need a lot of footnotes to explain. But definitely this, this has happened later on. The, the example I can think of is the 10 Things I Hate About You. It's all in modern language, and actually uh, they insult... Uh, Kate of that uh, of that film in quite modern terms. I, I can't quite remember, but something to the effect "bitch from hell," which Shakespeare didn't didn't write. So so yeah, it's been done after afterwards. I'm just scanning through to find ah how popular were bowdlerized editions of Shakespeare? What did people say about it at the time? Uh, this is one of those questions where if Edmund was here. That's his, yeah, let's that's his, evoke Edmund, because yeah, yeah, yeah. he, he knows everything about editions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, from what we know from Edmund's work, they were very popular, and there was a market for them, and particularly in the States, you know, for particular uh, demographics, it might be women readers, genteel women readers would buy these versions of them, and they were mass-produced, and there was a lot of money in it. So clearly, uh, there, was, there, there was a market for it. And then, what's interesting about that is, of course, that's just one instance of uh, the, the kind of editing, the, the censoring of, of Shakespeare, there are lots of other ones throughout history, but that's, that's a kind of notable one. Yeah, but if, even very soon after Shakespeare's death, during the Restoration, the plays were not so much bowdlerized, but uh, totally rewritten. Like Nahum Tate's King Lear, spoilers, has a happy ending. Um, it's, it's totally a, a totally different play. And uh, the people who did it were saying, actually, you know, we've got this really promising material in Shakespeare, like a heap of jewels, but it's all jumbled. We will make it better. And so they did. And it goes back to that Thompson and Turchie quote about suggesting you get students to do that. If we do, they're not doing something 
new. People have been doing this for a long time and, and we shouldn't condemn students for wanting to do that. I think we're on our very last question and then we have to close, unfortunately, because we are actually already at time. Um, <clears throat> this question, I think, is, is quite relevant to the last bit of what Adam was saying about trigger warnings. Um, given the point that academic signposting post stroke tw trigger warnings within current syllabus may engage students to effectively opt out of engaging with difficult subjects, um, is there any professional conjecture from the lecturers on what could be offered to replace such a requirement in forming a comparable student experience? Um, if anything, do we risk a future of emotionally avoidant academics? That's a great question. To which... Uh, right, OK. Um, so I tried to suggest one way of doing that, which is getting to speak, or getting the students to think in terms of the text themselves. What are the texts trying to do? The texts are trying to stage debates. They are trying to be controversial. It goes back to the first question. There was a point, there was a commercial point to being offensive. When you acknowledge that, you can then go, all right, see what they're saying in that context. It's not trying to offend you, per se. It's engaging with it, 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 its own moment. So maybe we should try and put our heads in that, in that moment as well. That's, that's one way. But um, I don't, the thing is, I think it's probably exaggerated. I don't think many students are saying we're not, we're not reading this or we're not going to read this. I, from my experience, actually, students are very willing to take risks. Yeah. Um, even if a student to begin with says no, then I had this, this weird experience. Well, maybe it wasn't weird. I was just very naive. I was at the beginning of my academic career. I was teaching Sarah Kane's Blasted and I got this email from a student uh, saying... Um, Hi, Monica. Um, I've read Sarah Kane's Blasted. I wish I hadn't. I don't want to talk about it. I'm not coming to the seminar. Okay. Uh, and then when she turned out to the next seminar, she actually engaged with Sarah Kane's Blasted in quite interesting ways. So it's clearly kind of offended her and got her really hot under the collar. But it never made her um, shrink from from debate. So I suppose it's about just saying it's okay to feel like that. What's the next step? Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Hansen you. and Dr. Shmielkowska. Um, thank you very much too to our audience for your attention and questions. We'll be sending you a link to the video and transcript very soon. Our next literature lecture is by Professor John Mullen on convincing fiction on the 28th of October, and you can sign up online. <laughs>